Um, good morning, Woodland. Good morning. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the photos of the Huntington mission trip that we're up. Uh, just a couple of things I'd like to highlight from the bulletin this morning. Um, there are just two sessions of tofu left um, on Thursday evenings at 6. Uh, make sure you mark your calendar uh, next Sunday for that hymn sing and devotional at Lutheran Hillside Village. Um, also, if you haven't been over here in the Mosaic Room, um, uh, we have um, some books, books, books from Pastor Joel's office um, during the transition. He's realized he has some books he doesn't need anymore. Um, with that, um, looking forward to worship with, with you all this morning. Good morning. We're going to start by standing together and reading from God's Word together, Philippians 2, verses 16 through 11. Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please sing with us. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love!
This morning we're going to be praying for the country and the believers in Oman. Um, the country is largely Muslim. Um, there are a few believers in the country. And they usually meet in, in homes and in small groups more um, secret um, for fear of persecution from friends and family and the government. So let's pray for Oman. Um, Father God, um, we praise your name, and we want to be able to say this morning that you are worthy um, and that you are worth it. And God, specifically, we pray for believers in the country of Oman, where God, they have said you are worth it. Um, the fear of losing friends, family, status in the community, possessions, perhaps giving up everything to follow you. And God, you are worth it. You have the keys to eternal life. You are the means of eternal life, God. We thank you and praise you for that. God, we pray for people um, in the country right now who are considering um, the claims, God, of your son, Jesus, and are considering perhaps following him with all of their lives, God, and help them this morning and in the weeks to come say you are worth it. So we pray for their safety and with the believers there, protection, courage, God. We, in the midst of persecution, we ask that their faith would be made strong, stronger than anything we're even aware of, God. And we also pray for the, the missionary workers who are working in country to distribute Bibles and literature, Christian material. Um, God, we pray for favor, um, that the word would go out. Pray for your protection, that your will would be done, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning. As the children head out for children's worship, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, we'll be focusing on 21 through 28, but we'll be looking at various parts of the the chapter. Uh, If you are a longtime football fan, you might know the name Leon Lett. Uh, He played several years for the Dallas Cowboys. He was a defensive tackle. He's, He's probably about my age, which tells you he played a long, long time ago. Uh, But when he played, uh, he weighed about 300 pounds. Uh, He's 6'6". So, big guy, defensive tackle. He became famous for something I'm sure he wishes had never happened. In the Super Bowl against the Buffalo Bills, which was played on January 31st, 1993, he recovered a fumble. And he began, began, began racing toward the end zone, and it looked like this is going to be an easy touchdown. Now understand, a defensive tackle never gets it to touch the football. They never carry the football. And the fact that he's about to score a touchdown, he's going to score a touchdown in the Super Bowl was big stuff. Now, you've probably watched football and seen, you know, running backs and wide receivers. They're, you know, more like six feet tall and a 180 pounds, and they'll start hot-dogging as they get close to the end zone. They'll hold the ball out so everybody can see it. They may be high-stepping. Deion Sanders, he played in the 90s too. He was very, very good at that. He'd do the high step and hold the ball up, and he was just a hot dog. Well, at 6'6 and 300 pounds, Leon Lett is no Deion Sanders. But that day he tried to be. And as he got close to the end zone, he held the ball out from his body, and he kind of slowed down a little bit to try to taunt the other team, is what it appeared. And he was extending his glory for just a little bit longer. What Leon didn't know was there was a Buffalo Bills player right behind him. And when Lett was at the three-yard line, three yards from scoring a touchdown, the Bills player knocked the ball out of his hand, and there was no touchdown for Leon Lett. There was no glory, and there was no dance in the end zone. But the play did become an NFL highlights favorite, and it earned Mr. Lett a certain amount of notoriety. Matter of fact, that type of play became known as a Leon Lett moment. Looks really good and then turns really bad at the end. A Leon Lett moment. The Apostle Peter is about to have a Leon Lett moment in Matthew 16. In verse 15, Jesus asked the question, and he's talking to all the disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter more or less, That's right, Simon Peter. And you are a rock. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Now, I don't know what Peter's immediate reaction to that was, but I can imagine what my reaction might have been. I might have stood up and said, Hey, boys, y'all hear that? James, why don't you repeat that for everybody in the back so everybody knows exactly what Jesus said just now. And by the way, Thaddeus, you're carrying my briefcase from now on. You know, that kind of thing. Well, hopefully I wouldn't have reacted quite that badly. But Peter did not have the opportunity to overreact because he was about to have his Leon Let moment. Here's how it happened. After Jesus told his disciples about the future of the church, he began to explain to them that he is going to Jerusalem to die. And Matthew begins in verse 22... Peter took him, that is, took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. 
And look at what happened in verse 23. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. A Leon let moment. Talk about saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Boy, Peter did it. And so moments after Jesus said, Peter, you are a rock, he called him Satan. He called him a stumbling block. Wow, what a change. Jesus then went on to tell his disciples, what is the true cost of being his follower, of being a disciple? In verses 24 and 25, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. As Jeff just prayed for the believers in Oman, there is a cost for following Jesus. In some nations, much greater than it is here. But there's a cost to discipleship wherever you are. There's much more to being a Christ follower than just coming to church on Sunday morning. A recurring theme in, in my messages has always been the grace and the love and the mercy of God, how he can take a broken life and how he can put it back together. He can take a life that has been destroyed by sin and rebellion and he can heal the hurts and he can bring peace and he can bring fulfillment. But he can do nothing with a life until it's given to him. It has to be given to him. In order to experience the fullness of God's blessings in your life, you have to give him your life. He is your life. Now, Jesus Christ is fully devoted to you, and he expects us to be fully devoted to him. Today, we're going to talk about what that means to be devoted to him, to be a disciple of Jesus. Disciple is an interesting word. We usually associate with the 12 who followed Jesus for those three years. You know, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, all the rest. These were the first disciples of Christ. But not his only disciples, because every Christian, every person who says, I'm a follower of Jesus, should be a disciple of his. The word disciple in the Greek language means student or learner. You're a learner of Jesus. It was common in ancient times for teachers to attract followers and followers who would be committed exclusively to their teaching. They would basically become like an intern. They would become an apprentice to their rabbi. Common practice was the student would leave his home, move in with his teacher. He would serve him with complete obedience and treat him with absolute authority. And the disciple was expected not only to learn everything that the rabbi taught, but also to become like him in character. In turn, the teacher or the, the rabbi would provide food, would provide lodging. It was his way of ensuring that his teaching would be carried out to future generations. When the Gospel of Mark says that Jesus appointed 12 that they might be with him. That's what Mark is referring to. That kind of custom, that they would be with Jesus all the time. Now, obviously, we know that Jesus is the only one worthy of this kind of loyalty. There is no preacher, there is no teacher today who has the right to claim absolute authority over your life. But Jesus has that right. He proved himself to be the ultimate teacher, the ultimate authority. He's the son of the living God. He has conquered death. He's conquered hell. He holds the keys to eternal life. So Jesus doesn't invite us to just be his casual acquaintances. 
He invites us to be his disciples, his apprentices, his devoted followers. So what does a disciple look like? First of all, a disciple is committed to following God's plan, not his own. So if we're going to be a disciple, we're going to say, I will follow God's plan for my life, not my own plan. Now, Peter, in all of his enthusiasm, objected to Jesus predicting his death. The Bible says that Peter rebuked Jesus. That means he's trying to set Jesus straight. Jesus, you got it all wrong here. You got it all wrong. Let me set you straight. I guess in the excitement of hearing that Jesus say, Upon this rock I will build my church. Peter had the misunderstanding that he and Jesus were now sort of like uh, partners, co-pastors, uh, equals. And he shows a whole lot of audacity. He corrected Jesus. And then Jesus put Simon in his place. He said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. What you have in mind are the things of men, not the things of God. See, the prevailing belief among the Jewish people at that time was the Messiah is going to come and he's going to establish a political kingdom and he will rule the world from Jerusalem. But the prevailing belief among the Jewish people at that time was wrong. It was wrong. God had a different plan altogether. His plan was that the Messiah would come into the world, would live a perfect life, would die on the cross for the sins of the world, and in three days he would be raised from the dead. The reality was Peter liked his idea better. He liked his plan a whole lot better. And so he made an attempt to set Jesus straight. And Jesus made it clear to Peter, I don't need to change my way of thinking. You need to change your way of thinking. You need to be committed to God's plan, not your own plan. So if we want to be followers of Jesus Christ, if we want to be apprentices, if we want to be disciples, it works the same way for all of us. We have to be committed to His plan for our lives, not our own plan, and not somebody else's plan. What is God's plan? In the early days of his Christian life, Os Guinness, who's written numerous excellent books, he believed that he had to prove his commitment to Christ by either becoming a minister or a missionary or pastor, something like that. So he had spiritual mentors, and they said, you need to go to work for this particular church. It was a very well-known church uh, in England. But he was absolutely miserable. God changed his heart and, and really let him know his calling by just a random conversation at a gas station. Here's how Os Guinness tells the story. He said, in the days before self-service gas stations, I had just had my, my car filled up with gas and enjoyed a marvelously rich conversation with the pump attendant. As I turned the key and the engine to my car roared to life, a thought suddenly hit me with the force of an avalanche. This man was the first person I had spoken to in a week who was not a church member. I was in danger of being drawn into a religious ghetto. Ten minutes of conversation with a friendly gas pump attendant on a beautiful spring evening in England, and I knew once and for all I was not cut out to work full-time in the church. He said, that's not what I'm supposed to do. Instead, as he began to pray, he read Scripture. He sought God's guidance. He discovered that God was calling him to be at work in the world so he could use his gifts to build relationships with people who don't know Christ. And that's what his books have been about. Now, after God released Guinness from what he thought he was supposed to do, Guinness found real freedom and real fulfillment to pursue God's calling on his life. 
in order to be a disciple of Jesus, we need to be fully committed to his plan for our lives, not our own plans. But here's the good part. His plan is always better. I'd say most of the time it's probably harder, but it's better. You may have in mind for yourself an easy life. What God has in mind for you is a great life, a fulfilling life. So we need to get our minds off the things of men and focus on the things of God and commit to following his plan. That's what a disciple, an apprentice, a learner will do. Second, a disciple is prepared to pay the price. What's the price of discipleship? Look at verse 24. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Three things Jesus mentions. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Let's talk about those three things. First of all, deny yourself. The Christian life is a life of saying no to me and yes to God. We may be thinking, you know, I want to get even with that guy. I want to teach that guy a lesson. But it doesn't matter what I want, God. It only matters what you want. So I will treat him the way you want me to treat him. I will repay his harshness with kindness. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm so tired of struggling financially. I could just cut a couple of corners here and there. It relieves some of the pressure, and no one would ever know. But God, it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. I will do the right thing. Denying yourself. It's not a one-time event. It's a lifestyle of saying no to me and yes to God in every area of life. Then take up your cross. You ever heard somebody say, well, that's my cross to bear? People say that sometimes. I've got a, a, a husband who, who doesn't know Christ. That's my cross to bear. Or I've got rebellious children. That is my cross to bear. Or my arthritis acts up on me. That is my cross to bear. There's a tombstone in a cemetery in Ribbesford, Scotland. It has this epitaph. The children of Israel wanted bread, and the Lord sent them manna. Old John Clark wanted a wife, and the devil sent him Anna. I guess Mr. Wife thought his late wife was his cross to bear. That's not what Jesus meant. He's not talking about a circumstance. He's talking about an attitude that we have. Do you know what the cross symbolized to the early Jews? Same thing it symbolizes to us. It symbolizes death. It's death. They were familiar with the image of a convicted man walking through the streets of the city on his way to his execution, carrying the cross with him, the cross upon which he will be nailed and he will die. Of course, the disciples realized Jesus is speaking symbolically, he's metaphorically. He's saying that to follow him, we have to be willing to pay any price, even the price of death. Taking up the cross may mean that we're willing to risk embarrassment, criticism, rejection, persecution, and if necessary, our own lives for the sake of following Jesus. Luke's gospel adds another word to the phrase. He says we must take up our cross daily. Taking up your cross is a mindset. It's an attitude. It's a lifestyle. It's something we do every single day. Then Jesus said, follow me. You ever play follow the leader? At some point, we've all played follow the leader. Leader touches his nose. You touch your nose. Leader stands on his head. You go stand on your head. You ever play the game uh, basketball? Horse. You ever play horse? You know, one guy makes a certain shot and everybody else has to stand in the same place and make the identical shot. If they miss, they get a letter. 
The key to these games is that you do exactly the same thing the leader does. That's the same objective of the Christian life. Do things exactly the way your leader, your teacher does. The Christian life consists of following Jesus, of doing what he would do in every single situation. You may not be able to open the the eyes of the blind, but you can show compassion. You may not be able to feed thousands with a few fish and a little bit of bread, but you can be sensitive to the needs of other people. Following Jesus means making an effort in every situation to do what Jesus would do, to live as he would live, to treat people as Jesus would treat them. It's not always easy. There is a cost involved. But a disciple is willing to pay the price. And what is that price? It's self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. We give it up for the sake of Jesus Christ and for his kingdom. We give up what we want for what God wants. Third thing about a disciple is the disciple gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Look at verses 25 and 26. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will gain it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world Yet forfeits his soul. The Christian life involves taking risks. If all that being a Christian man was to come to church and put something in the offering plate, then all we would do is risk a little bit of time and a little bit of money. But that's not what being a Christian is. A Christian life, following Jesus, being a disciple, involves giving your life, all of your life to Jesus. All of your dreams, all of your desires, all of your hopes, all of your plans, everything that is within you, you give it to Jesus. Being a Christian makes a difference in the way we approach our careers, the way we approach marriage, the way we raise our children, the way we approach our free time, the way we spend time with friends the way we handle our finances, the way we react to strangers. I mean, it's, it's everything, on and on and on. It's everything about us. It's everything about life. It encompasses every aspect of our lives, every minute of every day. Therefore, if the Christian life is nothing but a sham, then we are the world's biggest fools because we've given ourselves the lives of self-sacrifice and obedience instead of just building our own little kingdoms and living for our own desires. But Jesus says, if you hold on to your life and you can live completely for yourself and you live your selfish dreams, you'll end up with nothing. But if you give those things up, if we surrender them to Jesus Christ, we end up with everything. Everything. There are two roads we can take. Living for ourselves, which Scripture tells us that leads to eternal death. Or living for Jesus Christ. Living with Him. Giving our lives to Him. That leads to eternal life. Now, the self-made road, boy, it's going to have success. It'll have pleasure. It'll have acquisitions along the way. But Jesus says, are these more important than your soul? What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Following Jesus is a life of risk. Because you give up everything to be his disciple, everything. But it's a calculated risk. You know why? 
because Jesus has proven he keeps every promise. He has proven that what he said he will do, he will do. He's risen from the dead. He's conquered death. So, yeah, it's a risk, but it's a very calculated risk because you're giving your life to someone who's conquered everything. The disciple recognizes that without Jesus, life is meaningless. And the best we can hope for is just to acquire stuff that's just going to slip through our fingers at the time of death. And the disciple realizes that if he'll give up his meaningless life, then God will give him a life that is beyond his wildest dreams. A disciple gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. How do we do it? Self-sacrifice. We give up what we want for what God wants. Now, there is a cost to discipleship, and, and I think very clearly the return is exponentially more than whatever we invest. I mean, an investment's still required. And what's the investment? It is your life. It is your time. It is your money. It is your all. It is your hopes. It is your dreams. It is your desires. It is your goals. It is everything that is you. That's the investment. You surrender them to Jesus. Not to the church, not to the pastor. You give it to Jesus, which means to be a disciple, that fully devoted follower of Jesus, to be that apprentice, is to live with the attitude, not what I want, but what God wants. A lot of you have seen the television show, Everybody Loves Raymond. It was popular for a number of years. And... Uh, the final episode aired in May of 2005, which I couldn't believe when I read this this week. It's been that long. But the star of the show was Ray Romano. And he'd been a struggling stand-up comedian, and then he became one of the highest-paid actors on television. And at the conclusion of the last day's filming, Romano stood on stage, and he was speaking to the studio audience. And he was thinking about and reflecting on his past and his future. He read a note that his brothers had stuck in his luggage the day he'd moved from New York to Hollywood. It'd been just nine years earlier. He said, my older brother Richard wrote this. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And Ray Romano, with, tearful, with tears in his eyes, said, Now I'm going to work on my soul. Are you ready to work on yours? Are you ready to work on your soul? You remember when I said the word disciple means student, it means learner, it means apprentice? That's what it is. It's a learning process whether you've just become a believer or you've been a believer for 30 or 40 years, the process is the same. Take up your cross daily and follow him. Follow him. In just a few moments, we're going to sing together. I'm going to be here at the front. I'll be glad to pray with you about working on your soul. Cheryl's going to be up here to pray with you. Jeff will be up here to pray with you. And we want to pray with you about that next step you take in following Jesus Christ. So I'm going to invite the musicians to come on up. And let me say this, that after we sing our benediction, I'm going to ask you to stay for just a moment because I have a presentation uh, to make. But I want to invite you to come as we pray. Let's pray together. Jeff and Cheryl, if you'll come on up, and then we'll pray. Father... Help us to work on our souls, to give ourselves fully and completely to you, to be disciples, to be apprentices, to be fully devoted, to give up what we want 
and to follow what you want. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, and you come as God's Spirit leads you. Most of you know Ron and Karen Smith, 
Uh, they've been a part of worship for some time in Bible study. Matter of fact, Ron taught a class this morning. Uh, Ron was on the mission trip with us. He was able to go, and uh, everybody was able to get to know one another a little bit better when you're on the mission trip. But they're coming this morning saying God has led them to place their lives in this church. Uh, be coming by letter from College Heights Baptist Church in Chickasha, Chickasha, Oklahoma. So if you are glad to see Ron and Karen make this decision and you will welcome them to be a part of Woodland, would you raise your hand and say amen? Amen. amen. And God bless you. We're so glad to have you. Your deacon will be Mark Davis. Deacon, uh, Mark's going to come stand with you. And I'm going to say in just a moment you're dismissed and you can come by. If you haven't welcomed or haven't met Ron and uh, Karen, they'll give you a chance to do that. Pardon? Karen, she can't get close to me. Okay, all right. So do you want to sit right here? Okay, Karen's just going to sit down. Can't, can't get close to too many people right now. Uh, but give you a chance to at least come by and say hi. You can wave. And uh, you'll know who Ron and Karen are. Be praying for them as we pray for one another as we journey with Jesus together. All right, let's stand together. God bless you. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.